Welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to talk about max, maximum ecosystem and maximum interoperability uh, lessons learned from building 3,000 plus multi vendor open stacks a month. Um, so, yeah, that, that's correct. Um, believe it or not, we build 3,000 open stack uh, installations a month um, <clears throat> across a, a diverse uh, ecosystem. And to us, the maximum ecosystem, maximum interoperability equals oil, which is our open stack interoperability lab. And uh, that's where we validate these op open stack ecosystem. Uh, it's 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So this is something that we do nonstop. Um, it's basically one massive continuous integration engine where we vet um, multiple hardware platforms from uh, you know, a vast number of, of, of partners that we have, multiple software component vendors, uh, new open stack components, uh, and massive number of different configurations and uh, vendor clouds that we bring up. The reason we do this is because building clouds is not easy. Um, trust us, we do it all the time. Uh, we, we think we're pretty good at it, and what we've learned is that it's not easy. Uh, each one seems to be a snowflake, um, and it's only getting worse. Uh, I mean, I, I'm amazed when I, when I come to the OpenStack Summit, it seems like each time uh, it gets larger and larger. Uh, I'm sure you guys think the same. Uh, and just walking around, uh, seeing the number of partners uh, out there that, that, that we have, and the, the number of potential partners uh, and vendors related to OpenStack is, is pretty massive. So if you go to uh, the marketplace, the OpenStack marketplace, and I did this uh, about a day ago, there was over 100 plus drivers today um, across, I think it was five or six different categories, you know, Neutron, uh, Cinder, um, uh, what, what have you. Uh, and that list is growing and growing. Uh, so really what we did with the OpenStack Interoperability Lab was uh, set up this infrastructure to try and manage that, um, and to try and manage that um, most specifically with the partners that we have. Um, so moving on, uh, this is the partners that we have today. Um, the list is growing. Um, it's growing by leaps and bounds, which uh, is a technical challenge for us. So we need to scale um, both not only the infrastructure that we have within oil, but um, the people managing uh, oil as well. Um, but it, it's pretty impressive. Um, there's a lot of gravity towards it. Uh, we're very proud of it. Um, so just to give you some daily stats, um, you can see there we have uh, 100 plus OpenStack uh, installs a day. Um, that, that we do within the lab. Um, so that's 700 OpenStack server installs to bare metal, over 1,000 containers created a day, 2,800 bare metal power cycles, 46,000 uh, API calls, and 32,000 tests a day. Um, multiply that out and the numbers get pretty, uh, pretty big pretty quick. Um, so how is all this possible? I'm going to turn it over to Ryan, who's the technical lead for the uh, oil program, uh, and he's going to go through that for you. So Ryan. Thanks, Dan. Automation, automation, automation. This is uh, the only way to handle this kind of scale. And we do that using uh, the canonical software tools that allow us to build and scale out clouds. So uh, MAS, Metal as a Service. This gives us an API to talk about adding nodes, removing nodes, turning them off, power cycling them, releasing them. Uh, and then the cloud itself is OpenStack cloud is deployed via Juju and charmed up OpenStack components. Um, Juju is a uh, multi-cloud orchestration service that we use to bring all the different pieces of, of OpenStack, getting them configured correctly and connected so that when you're done, you have a working cloud. Uh, and then and this is all built on top of the Ubuntu OpenStack um, and the cloud, ar cloud archive where we host um, all the OpenStack packages that have been uh, prepared for use um, in building clouds. So those are our key pieces of technology. Um, we didn't get to 3,000 uh, clouds a month from the beginning. It was a much more modest uh, beginning, a lab with maybe 20 servers and uh, a couple bits of infrastructure. And so as we try to, s to scale that up, we, um, we face some challenges, since that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, as the program grew, so, so grew the um, the hardware that we had grew as well. And so we had lots of hardware sitting around um, and we needed to make sure that none of them were idle, right? The goal was if we've got a box, we need to be able to use it. Um, so we needed to scale up uh, the number of runs that we did in parallel. And um, uh, when we build clouds, a lot of times, uh, at least in oil, we think about how many physical machines do we need for one of the particular configurations. And sometimes we had, um, you know, leftovers, right? If I need 20 nodes to build a cloud and I have 22 servers, I got two that are sitting around kind of idle. Um, and so we said, well, is there some way we can, we can fix that? So we started using uh, um, 
uh, LXE or LXD as we talked about earlier today, um, to uh, co-locate services and put them in containers that allowed us to roughly cut the hardware cost in half. And so and suddenly instead of uh, only two OpenStack installs for 22, or we could run you know, three. If we put this down there, I get 21 in there. So we, we did that across the cloud, um, off, across the lab. Um, and that gave us more, you know, we could run more clouds with the same amount of hardware, which for us, that was our, that was our goal. Um, and then the other thing that we needed to, to handle this was a, w a way to track, you know, what machines were in use, what machines weren't in use, um, when were they ready, and, and when they're not. So um, we use a, a, a queue management system that's built on top of the Mass API to see what hardware we have in the lab, what are the capabilities, um, what's available, what's being in used, and then determine what we want to use next. Um, as we added different hardware from different vendors, uh, we have to deal with the fact that the, a lot of the, the physical vendors, uh, their hardware is different. So um, they all have their own BIOSes that have different options and settings and configurations. Um, all of those different machines and option ROMs have different timeouts and different characteristics. Um, there's a physical network in these machines. They, some of them come with spinning disks. Some of them have SSDs. Um, and one of the first variables we encountered with all the different uh, partner hardware in there was um, the life cycle for bringing a node up for use with MAS goes through this multiple boot phase. Um, some of the hardware went through this really quickly, right? So we would ask MAS, give me a node, and it comes back really quickly with that. Other times, some of them would take a really long time to boot. Some of the enterprise uh, uh, systems take a long time for that. So we had this variable time between when we would get a machine and was ready. Um, and the good news was the tools that we're using, uh, Juju, for example, you can control you know, how long it waits for these hosts to come up. And so with that, we're able to sort of normalize the hardware, you know, all these different hardwares. But from our consumption perspective, it was all sort of normalized. I can say, go give me six machines, and I get six machines back after a specific period of time. Um, all the different hardwares also have different ways to turn themselves off and on. So from IPMI to AMT, uh, some have BMCs. Um, we have to handle the fact that these are all different, and Maz gives us the tools for doing that. There's power driver plugins um, that we get to uh, figure out how to turn on these different machines, and this is all handled in Maz. So the oil lab, we didn't have to worry about that. Maz took care of that for us, um, but we do get to validate how reliable some of those services are because um, one of the one of the failure cases we've deployed a cloud and one of the nodes didn't come up. We can go and we can find out what that is, file bugs at the appropriate place, and get that resolved. Um, the other fun one was local storage. Um, so a lot of the nodes will have a, uh, the storage on the system that we use for the different OpenStack services, Ceph, Swift, Glance. Uh, uh, they use storage in a different way. Um, but since we're reusing the same hardware all the time, over and over and over again, um, we'd encounter some issues where um, the storage may have had, you know, uh, LVM metadata embedded on it. And the next time we go to use it, you know, they were kind of say, hey, you've already used this before. So we found those, filed the bugs, got the charms fixed. Um, we're also driving some enhancements into mass to allow us to, you know, wipe the storage when we're done, if you want, optionally, so that, that the, the machine's just like it was uh, the first time you got it. Um, now, configuration explosion. So... <laughs> There's a lot of choices that you get to make when you're building your cloud, uh, from your compute backend choices, networking backends, image storage, um, uh, which release that we're running, both from the OS perspective as well as the OpenStack. So we're currently running about 146 different choice combinations. Uh, and then when we run that across all the different vendors that we have, we've got 1,300 different combinations that need to be run uh, in, in oil. Um, some of those things, that, and, uh, some of those combinations don't actually work, and we find that out. For those ones where we know there's incompatibility, the technology is just not meant to work together, then we blacklist that out so we're not wasting uh, our time. Um, and the net result is that we have to have a, a dynamic configuration of, of the cloud. And so we do that by taking our inputs, what were the choices we made, what are the constraints, which hardware that it can run on, um, those sorts of things. and. Uh, we have a customized OpenStack deployment that gets pushed out and run onto all the machines. Sure. 
Sure. Uh, so the question was, what releases are we covering in, in oil right now? Um, so we're running uh, both OT LTS releases, so uh, Precise and Trusty. And for the OpenStack releases, we're running um, uh, uh, Juno and Icehouse. Right. Uh, it's, it's mostly driven by what the Cloud Archive supports. So on the Canonical Cloud Archive page, they talk about what releases are supported. Um, the other thing that we, we handle here in OIL is to make sure that of all those 1,300 different combinations that we actually get to run all of those. So our queue is, is tracking all the different configurations, whether we've run them or not, to ensure that we're able to uh, um, cover that um, effectively. Um, the other challenge was the shared physical network. Uh, so we have a, a flat physical network where all these machines, physical machines that are connected to um, this resource has to be shared for lots of different things. So uh, the machines coming up, getting their own IP address, the containers coming up and getting IP addresses. Uh, when we're actually exercising tests, we have to allocate IPs for, you know, floating IPs for the test cases. And then even some of the uh, interesting um, uh, deployments, with charm deployments we have where they may have instantiated a virtual machine as well. We need to reserve an IP, so that's uh, accessible. And that was all uh, doable um, via MAT, so that was, that was a, big, a big help to have that in place. Right, so we have all these installs all the time coming at us. There's a whole lot of, of data. So uh, what we call a pipeline is sort of a run through the three major phases um, where we, we're going to deploy a cloud. Once the cloud's up and running, we have to prepare it for use, and then we're going to verify that it's working um, uh, as expected. And we, through those processes, we genera generate all this data, logs, results, status, um, and it gives us a lot of things to look at. And just as we talked about <laughs> automation, automation, automation is the way to handle this, um, that's what we're doing here now. We um, automate our analysis of the run, whether it was, a, did we successfully deploy the cloud or not? If not, what component broke? Why did it break? Looking through the logs to find those issues and those are tracked and put into launch pads so that we can fix them. Um, and then we also classify the, the type of error that it was for the, you know, was, you know, did we have an issue with the hardware? Did we have an issue with some software? Was it configuration? All these different things. So we classify this, and this is all done automatically as each run's completed. And so that, all that information then feeds into providing information back to the partners. This is uh, an example of a fictional uh, uh, a partner uh, driven from some of the data that we have in oil. And so this is what you get to see back as a vendor. Uh, on the top, going through the different, uh, some of the major components that have choices uh, that we run through. The vendor gets a view of when their hardware or software selection was picked, how successful was it when it was in a particular role. So for some of the, for the hardware vendors, this you'll see them across all the different choices because they get mixed up for the software vendors. Um, it's, it's not as, as interesting because their component runs on, on different hardware. Um, and then on the bottom half, what we're talking about is within a particular group like, say, Nova Compute, um, we could talk about the different back-end choices that, that are made. So, for example, um, did we do Nova Compute backed by VMware? Did we do Nova Compute backed by KVM? Or did we back it with LXC? And you get a distribution of the frequency as well as the success rate of that. So this just gives you a view of the types of cloud that have been built for that particular partner on a monthly basis. Um, and then the other part that uh, is critical for, for the, the vendors is what's the actionable data that we get out of this, right? So we're doing this automated analysis, and at the top we've done the classification of the types of failures that we've seen. In some cases we have infrastructure failure, something in the lab, somebody tripped over a cable, those sorts of things happen. Um, we have bugs in our own code that run all of this as well. Uh, but the more interesting ones are things like in charms. If it's a charm that the vendor wrote and authored, they need to know about it. Um, maybe it's an issue with an upstream package that we're tracking. Um, these bugs are filed as launchpad bugs and sent to the vendor for them. Um, and that allows them to, you know, to participate in fixing it, whether it's a community bug or anything like that. Uh, and on the bottom is just the test case history, right? So as we run these test cases over time and things change, either, you know, fixes are going into the upstream packages or, uh, or, or those things, then we can see um, how well uh, that's affected the, the net results. 
Um, the other thing we do is we add new <laughs> choices, right? They, as Dan said, they just we keep getting them over and over again. So we have a process for bringing in new choices. And some of the really uh, all the, the hot stuff coming right now is just SDNs all over the place. So um, when we have a new SDN come to be on board, we have to go through you know this process here where um, we say, look, let's charm up your solution. Let's go and put together uh, a Juju charm for your solution that fits in with the existing OpenStack. Uh, um, solutions there. So I spend some time charming that up, making it available. And the, the nice thing about the charm mm -hmm. for us is that it describes in a very technical way what are the requirements, how is this working with other pieces of OpenStack, and how do we do this in an automated fashion, because that's, that's how we build clouds fast and quick that work is with automation. Uh, once we have the charms from the partner, um, they're reviewed, and then we're going to put it out into our staging lab, where we're going to run the charm against a real, real hardware, real MAS, um, but it's not running on our production service. And this helps us flush out any other issues during the development of the charm um, that may have come up, some differences between the development environment and the actual runtime. Um, we also have a little bit more restrictive environment in place, um, and so we catch some bugs there where grabbing a package randomly from the internet or whatever, and we find that and find a more reliable way to bring that in place. Uh, and that means that the, the charms are going to be more robust, so when customers are actually using these charms, it's going to work for them. Uh, once we're happy with, uh, you know, how the charms are running in, in staging, then we bring it into production. So we have a, a two-week cadence where things that we've added into staging, if they're working well enough, then they can be promoted into production. Uh, so one of the ones that we just added uh, was Contrails. So, so this is just a juju gooey picture of the Contrails charm. Uh, with all the different components and how they're relating to the standard OpenStack services. So I've um, uh, got a couple of the you know, solution-specific pieces up there with the Cassandra uh, backend and uh, some other pieces. So that's just sort of a, a picture. But we, we got the Contrails YAML from, from Juniper. We deployed it, make sure that's working, pushed it into staging. It's been running in staging for a couple weeks, and then it's been promoted into production now. And the goal here, right, um, finding if all these things work well with other stuff for a partner, is that when oil comes back and your solution has been vetted and it runs, right, these things run really well, this means that the validated configurations can be put into the cloud installer, right? So these are options for, for partners. So part of the uh, you know, value of coming into the oil program is getting this vetting and then uh, having a, a solution where this, uh, this component, this choice can be taken to market. So uh, most of the, the stuff that we're doing, oil, we talked about was the infrastructure components, so all the, how is the cloud working, how do these pieces work together, um, but there are a lot of other partners who have things besides OpenStack infrastructure components. They have software that's going to run on top of the cloud. Um, and so OIL has a way for us to validate that your application is going to run against these clouds that are all configured in different ways. So maybe you haven't built your cloud in <laughs> 146 different ways, but we have. And we have a way for your application to be tested against uh, these different infrastructures. Uh, so above the line, these applications, we, we put together a charm solution for the application so that it gets deployed on these, all these different clouds. And then the test cases provided by the vendor we run to validate that, yes, my application is running as expected and it's run as expected across all of these different, uh, uh, all these different cloud types. So that's, uh, that's where we're at with that. Uh, any questions? So there's no performance testing. So our goal here is to validate functionality of the OpenStack cloud uh, rather than any specific performance of it. Um, the challenge there is that since the clouds change all the time, you know, holding one variable or just changing one variable and holding a constant is, is really difficult uh, just from a coverage perspective. How do we, we, we do all that? So we're not doing performance testing. We're doing functional validation at this point. So that said, though, we will actually functionally validate a performance test suite in OIL to do performance testing outside of oil. So if there's a partner or someone who's interested in actually doing a performance test, we'll validate that performance test functionally within oil and then set up some infrastructure outside of it to do the performance itself. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, it, it depends on, on the application, right? I mean, there are some subtleties between implementations and back end. So, for example, Ceph Radox Gateway has a, you know, a Swift interface, but it's not exactly the same as the standard Swift. Um, so some of that's configuration, default configuration, some of it, it just depends. So um, it, it, it depends. I, I, you know, I, I won't say like we're always seeing trouble, but things crop up from time to time. So it's important to, to be able to validate that. Thank you. So before we take any more questions on oil, I think we'd like to introduce one of our partners that's, that's participated in this program with us um, and uh, uh, hopefully benefited from some of the results and data that we've seen out of it. So I'd like to introduce Sanju from uh, Juniper that's going to tell us about their engagement with Open Contrail in oil. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Yep. So yes, we did uh, integrate with uh, Contrail. Uh, so we, we integrated with Canonical. Say Canonical Contrail almost actually closed. I get confused this time of the day. I need to have coffee. But anyway, uh, my name is Sanju Abraham. I am a senior uh, solution consultant from Contrail. Uh, we started integrating with Canonical, and we've actually benefited from uh, some of these offerings from Canonical that uh, have been discussed by Ryan. And uh, especially if you run to some of uh, the challenges that uh, uh, both enterprises and service providers are finding in selecting a good HDN vendor. I actually have this cartoon in front of you by John Klosner, and it actually depicts the, the, the confusion and the chaos in the minds of these vendors trying to actually uh, go to the SDN vendors and trying to pick the right SDN vendor. So it's as good as you know, you're blindfolded, but thanks to the women folk who are basically you know, helping him out, making a decision, telling that, you know, go with Open Contrail and uh, uh, Ubuntu uh, OpenStack. So parody aside, uh, with Open Contrail uh, and OpenStack, what we've actually figured out with working with Ubuntu OpenStack is uh, uh, it scales. Ubuntu Open OpenStack basically scales, and it has uh, a good economics uh, added to it. If you basically go to the marketplace and try to uh, buy a good enterprise server, it costs more than what Ubuntu has to offer. Almost basically half to one third more than what we get from uh, Ubuntu OpenStack. Ubuntu OpenStack also actually has this whole ecosystem with good tools. And some of the tools have been already discussed uh, by Ryan. Uh, we use Mass, we use Juju, we use Charms to deploy the VNFs in the NFE cloud uh, that we spin for uh, the service providers. And Canonical uh, Oil, uh, we started integrating uh, early this year and have seen uh, results which are very impressive. And we basically, like, you know, the, the whole uh, continuous integration, when you talk about this agile environment where code is getting churned out and it is basically getting into the repository, and you basically have uh, Jenkins-based jobs to basically execute all the code, all the test cases and automation. What we find more interesting is there's also somebody who can uh, rely on, who is basically you know, helping us not just within our ecosystem, but in, in the, in the uh, uh, vendor-neutral ecosystem, trying to basically get different applications, different operating systems uh, to work with and to basically validate the solution. So that gives us a very good uh, uh, feedback. And Open Contrail uh, plays very well into this uh, ecosystem. What Open Contrail provides uh, is basically routing and switching, uh, IP address management, uh, uh, and virtual DNS. It basically provides the service load balancing security. And uh, today, what we are going to focus more on is basically the dynamic service chaining aspect of it. So in the uh, network virtualization and software-defined network, what are the 
most common things across the NFE and SDN is basically the dynamic service chain and management and orchestration. So let's look at the uh, NFE high-level architecture. So if you look at uh, the uh, architecture diagram, and uh, this is what is, uh, we are implementing, uh, is you basically have, and this is basically close to the HC spec for NFE, and we are close to the HC standards. We have a service EMS, which is basically defines the whole um, um, FCAPs for the VNFs that are getting uh, spun on the uh, open contrail and uh, Ubuntu open stack. And you basically have an OSS system which ba is used to, uh, uh, in the service provider environment, there's basically OSS systems that help you to orchestrate uh, all the um, VNFs that are basically spun up. Now in the current uh, industry, if you see, all the VNFs are basically in a physical servers, and these functions, uh, network functions, are basically uh, hardware devices uh, that are basically getting requests from the EMS uh, or from the OSS. Now what we've done in Contrail is the speed of actually spinning up these VNFs to basically have not just service agility, but service uh, uh, monitoring as well from the OSS systems and the service orchestrations actually driving uh, down from the OSS systems, calling the heat APIs that we expose as part of Open Contrail, and the heat engines is basically running on uh, uh, on the Open Contrail Open Stack system. So, if you look at the the flow of uh, of Mano, Mano is basically the management and uh, orchestration in the HC framework. If you look at the flow, um, once the VNF web provider uh, he needs to basically register through the OSS and uh, BSS system, and that entry gets recorded in the catalog. Now, once that uh, uh, VNF is uh, recorded in the catalog, the operator now has an ability to basically spin up dynamically at runtime uh, that uh, VNF. So all that he needs to define is a template, and this is basically hot heat uh, orchestration templates. And once he defines the heat orchestration templates, he orders the OSS system to go ahead and spin uh, that uh, VNF. And at that particular point, uh, when NFVO, which is a, uh, another abstract layer on top of OpenStack and OpenContrail, it receives the request, the REST API basically is, uh, is formed and it basically calls the heat API. And the heat API calls the heat engine uh, backend. And as part of the VNF, what is important is you need to basically create the virtual networks for the workloads uh, to basically uh, 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 send traffic through this new VNF that is actually spun. And uh, the traffic workloads basically now use uh, the VNF and the function that is offered. For example, if there is a firewall service that needs to be uh, spun dynamically and there are workloads sitting in uh, uh, virtual network A and B, then dynamically after the VN is uh, spun up, the traffic passes through the firewall, and then you get uh, all the firewall services. So the next step is basically it spawns the VNF after looking up the catalog, gets the VNF detail, and notifies the VNF manager. VNF manager is responsible for the lifecycle management of the virtual network function. And the VNF manager informs the EMS, EMS does the FCAPs, which is basically fault configuration, accounting, and performance. In this case, EMS completes the job of provisioning the virtual network function with all the configuration that is required for the virtual network function to operate. And once that is done, a notification is sent to the uh, NFVO, and NFVO again sends a REST API uh, to the OpenStack Open Contrail so that network policies are spun up, and these network policies enable the actual traffic flow, uh, because these are the actual network actors uh, for the traffic that needs to flow across the virtual networks into uh, the virtual uh, function, virtual network function. So what um, is important to basically learn from this is how Contrail actually helps in uh, service insertions across these virtual networks. This diagram actually gives you a very good example about how policy enforcement as well as uh, policy enablement of uh, a service uh, enablement um, 
helps uh, the traffic to flow seamlessly uh, from the green virtual network in this uh, uh, diagram to the red virtual network by dynamically spinning up uh, the, uh, the service instances through this orchestration. Now, if you look at the, the uh, implementation details as to how traffic flows between the green and uh, the red virtual network uh, through this VNF, when the, when the contrail is basically deployed, and we actually spoke, uh, Ryan was talking about how mass is used. So those boxes down where the VDDoS secure and vFirewall is, uh, is hosted, the, the, um, the, that server basically runs vRouter. And vRouter provides uh, encapsulation. It actually provides, it has MPLS over GRE, it has MPLS uh, over UDP and VXLAN termination to both top of rack and across the servers. So all the packets that actually comes from the virtual machine, which is now uh, the virtual DDoS or the vir uh, virtual firewall, goes to the vRouter and vRouter basically terminates it on the peer and then it basically forms completely a mesh kind of a network for, for tunnels to terminate on the top of rack or to basically go through the gateway to uh, uh, another node. So it becomes very seamless and easy for traffic uh, to basically flow um, across these uh, uh, VNFs by means of policy and by means of the encapsulation that, uh, um, that vRouter basically can do. So now, <laughs> Another uh, cartoon that I like from Dilbert, there's so much of virtualization that is happening. And if you look at uh, some of uh, uh, the early uh, uh, proponents and the, and the people who want to basically go the virtualization route, they kind of look at it and they come into their uh, IT shop and uh, tell their folks they want to basically go and adopt this virtualization. Uh, but it's not easy. Uh, it takes cycles, it takes effort, it takes uh, a good amount of understanding of what we need to virtualize. It just can't be like in phase one, a team of uh, blind monkeys will unplug unnecessary servers, and in phase two, uh, those monkeys will just hurl software at whatever is left. But that becomes actually a good automation or orchestra uh, orchestration uh, uh, done right. So contrail heat orchestration, um, what does it actually provide? It provides a way in which you can basically create virtual, virtual networks, um, IPAMs and DNS. It has uh, VNF parameters that can be uh, uh, create, uh, uh, input to the, uh, via the template files. It can create the service chain and the policies. So in the demo, um, I wanted to do a demo, but uh, uh, I need to basically switch laptops. So. Uh, I just have the screenshots, but this is basically the demo topology. So in this topology, if you see, there's a template file, which is a YAML file. Uh, it has uh, green and red networks, and uh, it enables uh, policy dynamically. And then this virtual firewall, which is basically from Juniper, it's called a VSRX and Firefly image, that gets spun up dynamically, and uh, the, the policy gets enabled. Um, and by enabling the policy, traffic across the virtual network always flows through the Firefly uh, to, uh, to the other virtual network. So this is uh, just the screenshot. I'm sorry if it is actually, uh, uh, the font is less. But the gist of it is it basically calls, if you look at it, it calls the heat stack create with a VNF template. And uh, it provides the environment in which all the parameters are defined. There is a template YAML file to generate the service chain. And that's about it. And then Heat basically goes and performs all the different tasks that are actually defined in the YAML file, creates the service template, creates the policies, creates the virtual network, spins up the VNF. And all the flow that we actually saw in Mano is done through this. And the advantage of this is basically we don't need to actually go with the Mano descriptors. You can just do everything for the virtual network enablement uh, uh, as well as virtual network function enablement and the traffic flow and the policy all through the uh, to the hot templates. And if you see, this is basically what it's in the uh, um, horizon. It basically shows you the name of the stack that uh, gets created and the template. It'll, you can actually uh, drill down into the resources, the events, and uh, uh, all the tasks that actually get spun up as part of uh, uh, this orchestration.
And this is basically the Contrail web UI. If you see, there is a policy, and the policy basically uh, uh, has the firewall enabled. And uh, you would see this is uh, the first in the, in the service um, orchestration where it is defining basically the template. So we've also partnered uh, with different uh, VNF vendors uh, uh, from F5, Nokia, Saunders, Riverbed, Sandvine. Uh, some of the videos that we have done with Firefla Firewall and uh, DDoS uh, are on YouTube. So you can actually take a look at those. And to finish, so what is SDN going to offer? Uh, SDN basically offers a greater agility, faster deployment, simplified architecture, whiter teeth, and uh, brighter children. Uh, so that's the promise that all the SDN vendors are actually giving out to enterprises and service providers. So hopefully somebody would actually you know, buy into this and, and uh, deploy it. So Open Contrail is completely open source. You can actually go to github.com slash juniper, and you'll find uh, uh, Open Contrail. Uh, you could actually download it. You could play, contribute back to the community. And for heat templates, you can actually go to uh, the URL as uh, shown below. Thank you. Thank you. So that was um, that was bang on time. We probably have time for just one or two questions, sir, at the back. Uh, so the oil test suite. Yeah. So uh, uh, one of the tests that we're running is uh, is based on Tempest for validating the cloud. So yeah, what we're running to validate the cloud is is just open source. Um, we have the ability to run other test cases too, so if vendors have their own test suite for a specific function, that can be added as well. Right, that's one of them, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, over there. Is Tempest publicly available? No, I'm actually going to the cloud. Ah. So, they're, they're, uh, so they're not publicly available from us. Um, if any one of those partners wanted to actually make them publicly available, they have the right to do that. So, so we give the results of this test, these tests back to the partners that we engage with. It's up to them to determine if they wish to make those results public. It's not, it, it, you understand that some of that is sensitive information. So, because there's lots of competitors in, the, in, the, in, this, in this environment, so. Yeah. yeah. So a, a lot of the actual partners have um, asked us about, you know, right to redistribute and, you know, the agreement is that they can, so. Sure. Last question, sir. So, as far as I understand, your testing has been done only on the open source project. So, maybe some insights for Yeah, so we do um, actually retain the right to publish some data as long as it's not partner specific, and some of that is um, lessons learned. Um, so we will be probably within a month or so be uh, doing monthly blogs, um, giving out some more generic type results. Um, we also learn well, there's a massive amount of collateral data, which, which Ryan says. So we also there's a lot of lessons learned, and we we have a wealth of knowledge of what works really well together and what may not work very well together. And I think those questions you're asking. Um, so one of the things that we do with the partner engagements is that if we find something that consistently works really well, um, we offer to actually have a route into our installer, um, which we talked about earlier today, um, so the canonical OpenStack installer. Um, so when you actually go through that, you have an option to you know, pick and choose the, the different solutions that you want. Um, but also things like um, uh, you know, publishing reference architectures based on uh, the results that we know work really well. Um, that's another thing that we're going to be doing in the future as, um, as, as part of this. I think that's the question you're asking, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, we're a little over time, so I appreciate your patience. Um, so uh, uh, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.